All righty. Well, goodness. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. And look, I'm ecstatic. I'm a little excited. We're in for a bit of a treat today, uh, hanging out with some of my good friends over at Specter Ops. And my goodness, uh, Justin, Andy, you all know that I am a fanboy. <laughs> uh, and I hope a friend, uh, but really loving all the incredible stuff that you're up to with Bloodhound, uh, Bloodhound Enterprise. And I think everyone tuning in just absolutely knows, hey, that is the go-to tool for digging into Active Directory environments. But it's not just that, right? We've expanded even beyond uh, on-premise instances, but I'd love for you to do a little bit of show and tell if you're willing uh, on all the sweet stuff that it's up to. And hey, please just fill in the gaps. Hey, who the heck you are, who, what you're up to. Uh, please, the floor is yours, my friend. <laughs> yeah. So I can go first. My name is Andy Robbins. My title here at Spectre Ops is I am Principal Product Architect. I'm one of the co-creators of Bloodhound, uh, along with Rohan Berserker and Will Schroeder. So we released that back in 2016. And uh, now I'm you know, working on it full time here at Spectre Ops. My history is on more so the red team side. So I come at this more with like the red team perspective. And um, Justin, maybe I could pass it over to you. Yeah, yeah. My name is Justin Kohler. I'm the VP of product here at Spectre Ops. So that's over Bloodhound Community Edition and Bloodhound Enterprise. I joined uh, in 2020 to help Andy um, and team create the blood like the Bloodhound versions you use today. That's my, my background. We also have um, Walter, uh, my Maltese, sitting right behind me too. So <laughs> he'll be he'll be with us too. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Well, I remember, hey, the last time we got a chance to chat, uh, we were super stoked and hype up about, uh, hey, the new improvements, the new changes, making Bloodhound significantly easier to get spun up and into action with. Uh, but my goodness, this is quite a rabbit hole. There is more, more, more to see. Um, but look, I don't mean to steal your thunder. I'm just super excited for whatever are the fireworks you've got to set off here. <laughs> yeah. I think today we will be focusing on the newest kind of tentpole feature that we shipped in both products recently. And it has to do with uh, attack paths that emerge out of user synchronization. Uh, and so the history of Bloodhound is that back in 2016, when we initially released Bloodhound, we modeled Active Directory attack paths and, and still do, of course. Uh, you know, so group policy, security group memberships, um, users being signed in, in different places, all that kind of good stuff. And then in 2020, we introduced support for Azure and Intra, which back then was called Azure Active Directory, of course. And so for the past four years, we have had both on-prem Active Directory attack paths and Azure and Intra ID attack paths in the product. But what was kind of missing until recently was the fact that these two things can actually interconnect and attack paths can emerge out of certain configurations that mean I can pivot from on-prem Active Directory up into Intra and vice versa. I can, I can pivot from Intra ID down into on-prem Active Directory. And we've known that these attack paths exist. We've known about this for a very long time. And now we have threat reports coming out from Microsoft, from other vendors that are saying, hey, the adversaries are actually abusing these kind of hybrid or cross-platform attack paths. And so now we are starting to have those modeled in Bloodhound. So it's easier for people to identify those attack paths, figure out what's the impact of those, and most importantly, figure out what to do about those to mitigate those, or in other words, increase the security posture of the environment, no matter how complex it is. Yeah, so I've got some stuff to share from my screen. What I'm going to be showing you is the Bloodhound Enterprise GUI, but everything I'm going to show you is also in the Bloodhound Community Edition uh, version of the software. So there's uh, nothing in nothing that we're seeing here that you don't also get in Bloodhound Community Edition. So like I said, what we're excited about right now is the fact that we have these kind of cross-platform attack paths. And the first kind or the first class of cross-platform attack path that we're focused on is user synchronization. So of course, with on-prem Active Directory, we can synchronize identities up into intra-ID and that then can create risk depending on certain configurations that might be in place. Maybe we have password hash synchronization turned on. Maybe we don't. Uh, maybe we have Cloud Kerberos Trust enabled. Maybe we have Windows Hello for Business, et cetera. So let's check out an example and I can kind of talk through what this looks like. Here in Bloodhound, I'm looking at actually the pre-built searches query uh, or the, the pre-built searches collection of queries. And so we can navigate to this by on the explore tab, come and click on Cypher and then click on this little folder right here. And this will expand out the pre-built searches here. Under the Azure category, 
Uh, I'll scroll all the way to the bottom here, and I've got this section here called cross-platform attack paths. And what I'm gonna click on is this first one here, and this says intra-users synced from on-prem users added to the domain admins group. And so that might be a little tough to, to understand the first time you read that, because there's a lot going on in that sentence. But what's a lot easier to understand is when you see the representation in the graph, which we can kind of more or less just read as a sentence. So what we have here is we have this intra user called D McGuire or David McGuire. So this user is synced to an AD user, an on-prem AD user called D McGuire. So same display name. They don't have to be the same display name and often they aren't, but in this case, they are the same display name. And then this uh, on-prem Active Directory user is a member of the domain admins group. And so what this is telling us is that we have an intra user up in the cloud, which is synchronized down to this on-prem user, which is a member of the domain admins group. Now let's talk a little bit about tradecraft. And to talk about that tradecraft, I'm actually gonna flip the script here a little bit. And instead of looking at from intra down to on-prem, we're gonna look at from on-prem up into intra. So let's look at a different example where we have on-prem users synced to intra users with intra admin roles direct, where the, the user themselves has the intra ID admin role as opposed to getting that through a group membership. And so the example we have here is we have an on-prem user named J Frank or Jason Frank. And this on-prem user is synchronized to an intra user named J Frank. And this intra user has the global admin administrator role permanently assigned to that user. So let's talk tradecraft. So I'm, I'm on the red team side, I'm on the adversary side. I see this pattern in Bloodhound. I wanna know how exactly can I take advantage of this on an assessment? How can I bridge this gap? How can I turn control of this on-prem user into control of the cloud user? And there are many different options. Now, one option could be that uh, password hash synchronization may be turned on. And if it is, then if we have control of this on-prem user, we can change the password of the on-prem user. And then the password hash synchronization process will happen automatically for us using like the MSOL account and the directory synchronization account. And when we change the password of this on-prem user, that will actually become the password of this intra user up in, up in the intra ID tenant. And so now we know the password of this J Frank user, and we know the password of a global admin. Now, anybody watching this YouTube video who has some experience with intra ID is gonna be like, wait a minute, Microsoft just rolled out security defaults that mean if I know the password for this user, that's not enough because it's gonna require MFA to get a token if this user has the global admin role. And what I would say is, you're right. And so, <laughs> You know, changing a password, first of all, is kind of a disruptive activity on the red team side. And anybody who's been doing red team assessments for a while knows that changing a user's password, especially one who has a lot of privilege, it's kind of a last ditch effort. Like you've kind of exhausted all your other options and now you're in kind of like, like scorched earth territory almost. Because if I change this person's password, the next time they go to log in with their real password, they're gonna realize it doesn't work anymore. That's gonna cause disruption and that's a detection opportunity. And, and on the right team side, we don't want to be detected. So there are other issues. You know, I already mentioned how MFA could stand in the way of actually taking advantage of this entire attack path, but there's also conditional access. Conditional access is becoming more and more commonplace in Intra as admins kind of wrap their heads around it and are designing and maintaining these effective conditional access policies. And so maybe there's conditional access where this Intra user actually can't get a token unless they're coming from a certain network location, uh, or maybe they have to be using a device that has a certain level of compliance, um, et cetera. So that can stand in the way as well. And so what this kind of leads me to is my opinion is that where adversaries are going to be pushed towards uh, tradecraft wise is not necessarily going to be with, you know, common credentials or password hash synchronization or anything like that, but it's really going to come down to tokens and it's going to come down to, you know, the systems that these different identities are using. And so what's going to matter for you know, who can abuse this whole attack path? What's gonna matter more is not necessarily, you know, who has control of this user and on-prem active directory, but what's gonna matter is what system is this user logged into? 
And so in Bloodhound, if we if we see this uh, accordion item right here that says sessions, this is going to show us what is the system that this user has logged on to. And so if we if we kind of go back and, and see the full attack path, let me set this as my starting node. And then, um, yeah, this will do. <laughs> this is, this is kind of cool. And so what we're looking at here is a full attack path that goes from this on-prem Active Directory computer to control of the domain um, that this computer resides in. And this is actually really cool because this is showing us like a, like, like a, a hybrid attack path. So let me set this layout like this. And so this, this edge right here that says the computer has a session for this user, J Frank, what this means is that J Frank has, or had an interactive logon on, on this computer. So there are going to be processes that are running as this user, there are going to like potentially clear text passwords, maybe in memory on this computer for this user. Uh, but let's look at this kind of like in the context of this part of the attack path here. So this computer has this user J Frank logged onto it, and this user is synchronized to this entry user J Frank. Now, when you log on to a computer, like your corporate device, maybe it's hybrid joined to Intra, maybe not. But when you authenticate to like Office 365 or SharePoint or whatever, you're doing that, you know, logged onto the computer with this user, but then you're authenticating to those cloud services using this identity. And so this computer not only has a session for this user, it's also very likely going to have tokens that are valid for this user. And so forget about changing the password of this user, J Frank. Like I'm gonna pivot to this computer. I'm gonna become local admin on it, or maybe not. And I'm going to not only have the ability to impersonate this user, I'm gonna have the ability to impersonate this user. And the beauty of that from the adversary's perspective is I don't need to worry about conditional access because this user's logged on from this system, I'm, I, I'm gonna do the same thing, easy. And if I'm abusing the fact that there are potentially tokens already on this system for this user, I'm also not gonna worry about MFA because MFA has already been satisfied. The tokens are on the host and they probably have the MFA claim. And so it's like, why change the password of this user and have that synchronize up and then like have all these roadblocks when instead I can just pivot to this computer and then ride the existing legitimate uh, authentication artifacts that are that are that are on that system to impersonate this user and and be global admin and have control of everything um, in the intra IT tenant. So that is where I believe adversaries are going to be pushed towards. And that's where I think the tradecraft is is going to be um, uh, further evolved like in the in the near future. Now the same thing is true when we look at the other perspective. So if we scroll to the right here a little bit, we can see that the global admin role, it has the ability to reset any user password in Intra, obviously. So global admin is, you know, equivalent to domain admin. You know, and domain admin has control of everything and always will. Same thing with with a global administrator. So we have this relationship from the global admin role to be able to reset the password of this user here, D. McGuire. And then D. McGuire is synchronized to this on-prem user called D. McGuire. And this user is a member of the domain admins group. Now, maybe password writeback is enabled, maybe not. But if it is enabled, there's going to be a roadblock that the adversary, adversary will run into when trying to abuse this attack path. And that roadblock is that the password writeback process doesn't work for users that have an admin count of one. And so this actually should say true. I'm not quite sure why it says false. Actually, I think I know why it says false. I think it's because I was testing something in my lab, but the, the user belonging to the domain admins group, that's gonna automatically flip that bit on the user property to uh, from zero to one for admin count. And so, you know, if we look at this from just saying, I can change the password of this user, this user synchronized to this user, this user, you might think, well, I'll just, I'll change this user password and that'll replicate down to on-prem active directory. And in most instances that will be true, but in this particular instance, that will not be true. But let me go back to what I was saying before about where exactly our adversary is going to be pushed. And uh, during the course of an adversary's operation, what placement do they have in the world, in the network, and in the identity infrastructure? And so if we think about, you know, what if we started not with, not with control of this on-prem computer? What if we started with actually initial access 
at the identity layer in enter ID. And so that would mean that we actually don't even have access to the corporate LAN. We don't have, we don't have layer two or layer three access to even take advantage of knowing this on-prem user's password. Maybe there's a VPN endpoint, but, but I think you get my point that, you know, if, if we're not placed already in the, in the LAN, knowing a local active directory users credential may not have that much value. So what's going to become more important and kind of what I'm working on now and like a little hint of, of what we're releasing in the future is we are looking at the relationships that can turn control of the intra ID tenant into not only control of on-prem users, but also control of devices that are hybrid joined to intra ID and on-prem active directory. And so that then creates the opportunity for us to turn residents in intra ID only into layer two, layer three access into on-prem active directory through Intune uh, script deployment, for example. And the attack paths that we will see, they, they won't necessarily be, you know, I'm global admin so I can reset this user's password and this is synced to, to this user here. It will be more like I'm a global admin and therefore I can deploy a script to this particular device. And that particular device has this intra user logged on and this intra user is synchronized to this on-prem user. That will let us see the attack path more similar to what we were seeing before with, you know, it focusing on the endpoint and kind of as a bonus, <laughs> the, uh, the, the hybrid join devices they're actually always going to be an on-prem user that is logging on to those devices. And so we'll be able to see that, you know, the intra user is associated with a, a, a log on session, let's say on a hybrid joint device, but it's actually guaranteed that the on-prem user is the one that's actually done the console log on on the hybrid joint device. So that's a little teaser of, of what's to come. And that will make these patterns from intra user to on-prem user much more interesting, I think, uh, because they're all gonna be about that trade crap that I mentioned earlier, where it's all about like token theft and impersonation, not necessarily changing passwords. There's one more thing I wanna mention, which is, you know, we're looking kind of like very, very specific relationships, you know, from, from an intra user to an on-prem user. But there's also an entire mm. class of abuses that uh, rely on control of the identity provider itself or of a asset that is managed by or trusted by that identity provider. So for example, in intra ID, we can actually do authentication using certificate services. And so maybe in on-prem AD, I take over the PKI infrastructure. And then maybe an on-prem CA is trusted to do certificate-based authentication in intra. And so that means if I take over PKI, now I have the ability to impersonate any user in intra ID. And similar things come into play with Windows Hello for Business and Cloud Kerberos Trust and all these different kind of uh, federated identity technologies that we're going to be able to model in Bloodhound and and show those attack paths, you know, as they emerge. So that was a lot. And I, I think like what might be good now is, uh, Justin, if you kind of show us yeah. like some of the real world examples that we've seen. Yeah, for sure. Before we do that, before we move on, John, like any questions about like anything we've seen here or anything I've said here so far? Oh my goodness, it's too cool. Uh, and I know, hey, yeah, trying to do the entire song and dance and whole showcase is tough to squeeze into one little video here. Uh, but have you demoed or showcased a oh, working through the attack chain and the attack paths previously? Is that something, I don't know, we could slap up, is there a link or there's some footage, anything that you might have up your sleeve? Yeah, so Cody Thomas and I, we did a webinar of actually showing step-by-step -step how these attack paths can actually be executed using Mythic, uh, Mythic C2. So that webinar, I think, is perfect for for your viewers to go check out if they want to see like step-by-step, -step, like how would an adversary actually mechanically do all of this? That, that would be the perfect thing. Super cool. I'll try to include a link in the description and fingers crossed, hopefully, maybe sprinkle some footage throughout the video as we're talking through it. But if I may, and this is just me, you know, I don't know, sit in the corner with my hand up, explain like I'm five sort of thing. Um, but obviously this is all from the perspective of you've already ran Sharp Hound and the Entra equivalent uh, collector to get 
all this data and spin it up in Bloodhound to start with, correct? That's exactly right. So you'll you'll need to do data collection with Sharphound and Azure Hound to be able gotcha. to see these kinds of attack paths. Now, is that because in my mind, I've at least just known it thus far as a single snapshot in time as to when you ran that collection. Um, but I think because there's a lot of variable and dynamics here of like, oh, when a user is actually logged in or has a session on one device, does Bloodhound ever do anything fancy where it's like, oh, always listening, always collecting and trying to loop in data? Or are you just kind of going off of that single moment in time? Yeah, so so on the Bloodhound CE side, it's more kind of like snapshot in time. Mm. Now, we do have an API with Bloodhound CE that can enable users to kind of automate a lot of that data collection activity. So you could set up a Sharphound and Azure Hound data collector to then be shipping new information constantly to the Bloodhound CE API. In Bloodhound Enterprise, we have all of that kind of more user-friendly, I guess I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a yeah. button instead of, yeah. Exactly, cool. yeah. Sweet. Thank you. I'm sorry. And I know that was just me wondering, uh, but sure. that's, I mean, oh, it's always just so cool to see it in action. And I know even just the little, oh, clicking around the visual graph, mm -hmm. like that's incredible to see it all laid out. And now just like, hey, here's your map. Here's your compass. Um, yeah. But Justin, I'm sorry. I'll let you. Uh, no, I don't know. Are there more stories from the trenches? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got more. OK, so I'm going to start with a couple links and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into some actual war stories that we've seen. So like this is what happens when you do like, uh, you know, maybe some users. You know, what? I'm actually going to show off another uh, kind of feature we released uh, around the same time and make your your eyes like relax a little bit. So oh. we do have support for dark mode now. Incredible. Much yeah, much, much <laughs> much better so this is like uh you know combining um this is just a larger data set than andy was showing where we go from like any user in an on-prem active directory forest to a couple different paths to take over global admin and you might ask the question like well how common is this and that was a common question that i had and kind of before i answer that question uh this actually just came out yesterday so this was a um uh, research from microsoft which was just this like escalation of ransomware attacks in hybrid cloud environments. So attackers are actually doing this. And specifically in that article, they talk about this session hijacking, uh, moving from on-prem users to cloud users. So it is something that people are using today. So you can use Bloodhound Community Edition and Enterprise to see all of those connection points and disconnect them. And furthermore, Microsoft actually uh, recommends that you do not do this, that you do not sync to privileged roles. So kind of wild guess, how many... Uh, out of a random sampling of environments, this is one thing that we were curious, how many uh, out of, like, say, percentage-wise, how many percentage of um, environments do you think had synced privileged roles if Microsoft says to not do that? It's like using your domain admin account to browse the internet. Uh, I don't know if I consider this glass half empty or in <laughs> one perspective glass half full, but is it is it more than half? <laughs> 100%. Okay. 100% of environments had it. What? And then, Wait, yeah. all, all, all of them. <laughs> all of them had yeah. it. And then, and then uh, how many uh, how many were syncing like global admin? Like that, that that's a really bad one to sync, right? That that's the worst way. More than half. 70%. 70. 70. Yep. Yep. Sheesh. Yep. So uh, it's pretty common. Uh, and here's here's an actual example. So this is from a real um, environment that we saw. So this is an on-prem user down here synced to an Azure user uh, who had the cloud application admin role. Um, it could add a secret to service principle um, and long story short, could take over the Azure tenant. So that was bad. And this was the kind of early research that uh, Andy and team were doing in the buildup of this feature, right? We wanted to make sure, first of all, that this problem existed, uh, that it was a problem that we could solve and and it was prevalent and so he we, he found it a few times but then we we're like well how how globally prevalent is this and it, it's pretty common and so here's another example this is that worst case scenario where you're going from on-prem user to global administrator um, and again like this cloud account is probably protected by mfa and condition conditional access right um and i think we all think of our active directory environments as a little bit more porous let's say that you know uh yeah. but if i can get to your active directory user then i and you may if you sync that privileged role i can now just take over your azure tenant so all that all that good work you've done is kind of thrown out the window so this this kind of syncing of privileged roles is really similar to you know you know s separate your admins from your users 
It's 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 the equivalent. As another fun example, here's a here's how sometimes they can get really complex and long. So uh, I'm not going to try to zoom in here and navigate through this, but this is three different domain trusts. So you're hopping three different domains. Where then we pivot up here to Azure to to grant gain privilege here. Go back down into an Active Directory domain, a fourth one, and then back up to Azure one more time to take over the tenant. So like these can wind like crazy through privilege uh, in most uh, environments. And then uh, something that we released also this year was uh, support for Active Directory certificate services. So the PKI abuses that uh, Andy was kind of hitting at and how he kind of take wants to take that further. Um, this is uh, Active Directory certificate services chaining up to control over the domain and then uh, eventually um, syncing to users and taking over the Azure tenant. And this is actually pretty common. Unfortunately, Active Directory certificate services is a kind of one hop the most, uh, I, Andy, correct me here if I'm wrong, but I think like in some of the default setting up of Active Directory certificate services, it basically creates escalation one. And so when you do that, uh, what we have found at least is a lot of the domain or all of the forest will have the ability to execute that attack, which is once one attack to a, a full control over the domain. Again, that gives you control over everybody's uh, user accounts. And now you can, in this case, pivot back up to Azure. Yeah. So and it's, it's especially devastating because, you know, with like Kerberos delegation attacks, there's, there's some mitigation against that. You can take a user and you can add it to the protected users group, or you can mark it as sensitive and cannot be delegated. But with ADCS, it's, it's kind of all or nothing. It's, I can impersonate every user in the directory, or I can impersonate no user in the directory. So when escalation one like this emerges, we actually have that, you know, directed at the domain head object. And it's because there is no mitigation outside of uh, enrollment agents, which get a little more complicated. But with escalation one, for example, it's every principle, every single principle you can, you can impersonate in that domain. So it's pretty devastating. I am not smart on ADCS, but from what I understand, it is an absolute treasure trove, right? Just like a one shot, you're king of the kingdom. Yeah. That's bonkers. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. Mature tooling, uh, varied tooling. So if I want to do it with Python, I want to do it with C sharp, like, you know, whatever, whatever you want, uh, whatever your operational constraints or situation, you know, happen to be, um, ADCS is a reliable and, uh, very, very prevalent uh, attack surface. Yeah. Yeah. And if you want to uh, learn all about that again, that's something that uh, we released earlier this year. You can learn all about that and dig into the details so you can learn about how ADCS attack paths are visualized. And, and all of this is found again in the community version, uh, which we'll throw in a link, you know, in the notes. But uh, I also wanted to point out we have sample data sets now. So if you, uh, you know, might be a little bit hard maybe to collect an, um, uh, data from your own environment. Maybe you don't have ADCS configured. Or maybe you're not syncing some of these. But if you want to see how they they appear in the wild, uh, we've included that data set here for both Azure and Active Directory. You can uh, stand up Bloodhound CE. Trust me, you can do it because I did it in eight minutes. And that was kind of a test for when we were uh, about to release it. You can get it up and running in under 10 minutes. Throw those example data sets in there and start picking them apart and, uh, and figuring out how it represents and, and what it means for you. So that's, that is uh, that's, phenomenal. That's everything. I know. I don't know if the data sets were an easy lift or a hard lift or one or another, but I think that is uh, just a, a great playground for folks just, again, wanting to see it and not being able to spin up an entire lab. So I hope everyone tuning in, anyone that caught the video might, hey, go take a look. Uh, we'll certainly get a link in the video description for that, though. But honestly, gentlemen, every single time it's like, man, this is a game changer. I, like when you were showing the graph of the three different domains and trust that you just hop through and then back up and then down again to the fourth domain. It's like, hey, you'd never even at all have that perspective when you land on a box. So that is the guiding light to like, okay, look, here's the here's the way forward. And that, I don't know, still always just blows my mind. You guys have incredible stuff and I could sing your praises forever. Um, <laughs> but are there more call to actions? How else can folks get in the mix and learn a little bit more and play with Bloodhound Enterprise or community? Yeah, I mean, uh, reach out, uh, you know, so obviously download Bloodhound CE, give it a whirl. Um, throw, you throw our example data sets in there. If you are a company and want to see what Bloodhound Enterprise could do to shut down attack paths, certainly reach us, you know, on Specter Ops website and we'll, we'll connect 
gratitude of the right resources on our side. Excellent. Well, hey, great seeing you both again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being willing to show me all this sweet stuff. Uh, I am so eager to learn more. And it sounds like, again, I guess ADCS is the next target, right? <laughs> That's what you're knocking on next. <laughs> Uh, just combining PKI with uh, hybrid attack paths, so it's yeah, like two, yeah, two different yeah. things. Like, yeah, Merging it's like a, yeah. more, yeah, more hybrid connections. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm excited for it, and hey, please hit me up uh, when you got something else cooking. But this has been incredible. Thank you so much, Justin and Andy. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, John.